Good morning. Welcome this Easter morning to the Tuolumne and Soulsbyville United Methodist Churches online. I know that you're hoping for Easter lilies and just being jammed together shoulder to shoulder and singing and choirs and everything else. Oh, won't that be so glorious when it does happen? But we're not quite there yet. But Easter still comes and we still celebrate and we still are the church together. And that cannot be stopped. Before a word of prayer, I want to share a poem. Uh, the poem is Crying is Welcome Here. It's written by Ashley Johnson. And, and then after that, just a short word of prayer. Listen to her words that were inspired by um, the gospel from John, chapter 21 through 18. Mary cried. She wept. She had the courage to cry. So we can cry like Mary. Even on this Easter Sunday, we can cry like Mary. Crying is welcome here. In fact, we must cry. We must cry when we are hurting. We must cry with the missing. We must cry with the dead. We must cry with those who suffer. We must cry with the marginalized, the silenced, and the forgotten. We must cry with those who lack bread. We must cry. Crying is welcome here. If we don't cry, if we don't cry out, if we try too hard to be strong for too long, if we don't release the pain, we will stand and only hurt ourselves. We must cry. How else will we be able to see our need in the resurrection service in our midst? Crying is welcome here. I invite you to join in a word of prayer. Oh Lord, even on this Easter Sunday, we, we come as fragile human beings. And Lord, we, we share our hurts, our needs for healing with you. Lord, we have those on our hearts who are hurting, maybe even ourselves, in need of, of healing. And Lord, some, some are hungry, some are crying out for justice. There are our brothers and sisters, the Asian American Pacific Islander community who are, who are living in fear of, of violence and assault. And Lord, we, we still have not gotten completely through the pandemic and, and there is need for, for healing and to continue to do the things that we need to do, so we, we pray for, for patience. Lord, we, we, we even confess that loneliness and fearfulness and the, the, the anxieties that, that we harbor in our hearts and minds keep us from being as loving and as kind, to being the the Easter people that you call us to be. And so, Lord, as we get ready to once again celebrate the glorious good news that the tomb is empty, that Christ is risen, Lord, we ask you to heal those broken places in our hearts so that we can fully embrace this good news. 
All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's continue worship together. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, everyone. The response of reading is Psalm 118. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And may God bless this responsive reading.
Our gospel reading this morning is from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8, the resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. So ends the reading of God's word. He has risen, the central portion of our faith. Amen. I invite you to join in a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, may all of our thoughts and our feelings, the meditations of our minds and of our hearts, and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, here we are on another Easter morning, gathered to celebrate the greatest event in human history, the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb. But we aren't here, are we? We're gathered together in our homes. There are no Easter lilies here in the sanctuary. No fancy dresses or Easter bonnets. Well, I can only guess. I, I, I don't know if you, you're dressed up to watch the service online. I know I usually have my slippers on and I have my comfy clothes. I don't know what happens at your house. There's no shouting out together, he is risen, and responding back, he is risen indeed. 
Oh, no choir singing. No, no crowd. But still, still we are the church and we celebrate. We remember the Easter story and song and word. We proclaim to the world that Christ is risen and that the world has not been the same ever since. But ironically, on that first Easter Sunday morning, the women came to Jesus' tomb expecting to do nothing, nothing like celebrate. They expected nothing but death and grief and painful memories. The surprise they experienced that morning changed their lives and the course of human history. What would you do if you came to a tomb and found that the, the stone, the big stone, had been rolled away? I don't know about you, but I'm human. Maybe, maybe I'd be filled with, with panic. It's not unreasonable. You, you know, we, we know how to prepare for death. We, we know how to respond to it. But how, how do you prepare for resurrection? How do you prepare to meet the risen Lord? Well, let's begin by, by taking a deeper look at our scripture lesson. Mark tells us that the Sabbath was over. Mary, Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they may go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when, when the sun was just about to rise, they, they went to the tomb. What were they feeling? I bet doom and gloom. Their Messiah had been killed in a humiliating death on the cross. His body had been laid in a cave-like tomb, and a, and a great big stone had been rolled up against the door. They were feeling grief over the death of Jesus, stress about the future, and anxiety. How would they remove the stone? For as they were walking along, they, they'd been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us at the entrance of the tomb? Ah, anxiety. It, it's a feeling of fear, of apprehension about what is to come. And that's exactly what the women were feeling. Minute by minute, their mental health was eroding. But when they arrived, they saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled away. But as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. They didn't expect to see anyone, so they were startled. And the man said to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. Their anxiety filled, fearful thinking had them focusing on bad news. But the words of the young man began to give them reason for hope. And then the man ordered them to go and tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. 
The young man changed their focus from doom and gloom to a new possibility for the future. He, he promised them that Jesus was going ahead of them, that they would be able to see him in Galilee. And so the women fled the tomb, filled with terror and amazement. Isn't that a good description? Since negative emotions can be hard to overcome, Mark admits that they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Yes, the fear that had been gripping them was, was not so easy to just throw off. It took time. And you know, it's true for us as it was true for them. Hasn't this been quite a journey oh, this past year? Huh. You feel like those women trudging to the tomb? S we've stumbled through so much darkness. We've experienced far too much death and grief. And there are big, big stones still in our way. And yet, and yet, this is Easter and we've caught this glimmer of hope. Are we in a moment of terror and amazement? The good news the good news is that the stone is gone, that the barrier has been broken down, and most of us, most of us still have fears about the future. Uh, and we often focus on worst case scenarios. This is what the women were doing as they approached the tomb, fixated on the enormous stone that they feared was going to block them from entering the tomb and anointing the body of Jesus. But guess what? Fear, fear is always worse than reality. Do you get that? Fear is always worse than in reality, our, our brains are crazy, writes Taylor Teverun uh, of HuffPost. Every day they lie to us about how terrible things are, how bad they're going to be. But when they, we finally ignore the fear, we realize everything is pretty much okay. The world will keep turning and we're going to survive. Yet the world is going to keep turning and God is going to keep on working. The women were so afraid of the stone that they never dreamed that God would take action and, and roll it away. Their brains were lying to them about how terrible things were and how bad things were going to be but then God replaced their doom scrolling with stone rolling. God will do the same for you. Don't let your brain convince you that the stone you fear will always stand in your way. Maybe you're anxious about something at school or work or home. Perhaps you're fearful of the future or loneliness or health issues. Don't let your brain lie to you. Since God is always at work, fear is worse than reality. Next, open your eyes and see that Jesus is no longer dead. The young man in the tomb sensed that the women were not going to believe what he was saying, so he invited them to see for themselves. 
Jesus is not here, said the man. Look, there is a place that you laid him. Jesus is not here. Jesus is not dead in the tomb. See for yourselves. Instead, he is alive in people who are showing his grace, his love, his forgiveness, his healing, and his justice. Jesus is alive and well whenever a stranger welcomes, is welcomed, a child is loved, a friend is forgiven, a patient is healed, and injustice is made right. Jesus is here. The, the hymn, Christ is Alive, was written by, by a pastor named Brian Wren. It, it was written for Easter Sunday, 1968. Just 10 days after the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Wren wanted to acknowledge the terrible loss while proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Christ is alive, he wrote. Let Christians sing. The cross stands, stands empty to the sky. Let the streets and homes with praises sing. Love drowned in death shall never die. Yes, a terrible crime had com been committed on the cross. An awful injustice had been done. But now, now the cross was empty and love would never die. The hymn makes clear that the resurrection is not stuck in history. It's not an event that just happened once and we just remember it, but it's a reality every time. The risen Christ, says Wren, is saving, healing, here and now, and touching every place and time. Jesus comes into contact with human suffering whenever it is experienced. And in the face of today's racism and violence, Jesus suffers still, yet loves the more. The, the hymn ends with the good news of justice, love, and praise. Truly, Jesus is not dead in the tomb. Instead, he is found in his followers who act with justice, love, and praise. Open your eyes. See that Jesus is alive and well in you and the people around you. A few of you will remember the name Leo Ryan. Ryan was a, a California State Assembly member back in the 60s and 70s. State Assembly members sought to create laws that were just, and Ryan took that responsibility very seriously. In 1965, when racial conflicts boiled over in the, in the neighborhoods of Los Angeles and Rot in Watts, Ryan, he didn't just study the situation. He moved in with a black family in Watts. And then for two weeks, he, he worked as a substitute teacher in a local high school so that he could understand the needs of the community. In 1970, Leo Ryan was named chair of the state's commission to reform the prisons. And in order to understand the actual conditions in the prison, Leo Ryan he asked to be put into Folsom Prison, which at the time was the, the worst maximum security prison in the state. He was arrested, strip searched, 
had his mugshot taken. He was confined in a prison cell. Ryan spent a week in Folsom, living like a prisoner so he could understand how to create a more humane prison system. He gave up his own freedom and dignity and rights to ensure a better future for others. In his short political career, Leo Ryan dedicated himself to the issues of social justice and compassion for those who didn't have a voice of their own. And sadly, he was assassinated in 1978 while trying to reach the members of James Jones Jonestown out in Guyana. Ryan had gone there to ensure that Jones's followers were not being brainwashed or threatened or held against their will in that isolated compound. One of his closest friends said of him, he would march into the heart of hell to see it firsthand. He would march into the heart of hell. Wait a minute. Don't, I, I know someone else who was willing to march into the heart of hell to rescue those that he came to save. One who was willing to give up his own power and divinity to walk in our shoes. Who gave up his life on the cross to save us from the power of death. Easter reminds us that Jesus came to save us, help us, and hope. Hope is closer than we think. So let's move towards new possibilities for deeper connection with family members and friends, new possibilities for vital ministry and mission in the church, and new possibilities of justice and righteousness in our community and nation. We don't have to focus on doom and gloom, not with a stone rolled away and our Lord calling us, calling us to go forward. That's the story of Easter. That's our story. Our story every day. Amen.
Welcome to the Lord's table. If you didn't already gather your bread or cracker or your cup and, and get that ready, you can pause and, and get your elements so that you can participate in uh, Holy Communion. Uh, go ahead and do that and then start back up again. We don't often have Holy Communion on Easter because it's usually so filled with other other events, we'll, we will, would move it if it fell, falls on the first Sunday, but it, it gives us that sense of being connected with Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and everything that was had to happen so that we could celebrate the resurrection today. I, I want to start with an Easter confession. confession um, often that's a part of the liturgy of communion that we, we kind of jump over. Uh, this is a, an excerpt from the River of Life um, Holy Communion service. So let us be in an attitude of prayer and self-examination. Christ, we come to the empty tomb. We see our own death. We see our own tomb, we see our own emptiness, and we remember how we have treated other people, members of our family, friends, and neighbors. Lord, we come to your tomb. We see a hungry world before us, the pain of starving children, the guilt of war on our hands. And we know that collectively we share in these injustices. Lord, we come to the empty tomb. We search within ourselves and we cannot escape what we are. People caught up in the pain of our own wrongdoing. For some deep sense of loneliness and a frustration that we would be hurt or not. Lord, when we come to the empty tomb, we lay before you our pain, our emptiness, and we look to you for hope. People of God, why do you seek the living among the dead in an empty tomb? Are you afraid? Are you uncertain? Are you uncomfortable here? Our wounds are deep. We are turned away from that man. We have broken with him and we seek his fellowship. Do not dwell on your wounds any longer for he has risen to heal you. He has risen to forgive you. He has risen to change us all and bind us together now. Christ has risen to forgive us. Thanks be to God. Amen. What a powerful way that it connects us from Monday, Thursday to Easter morning, the, the, the day we celebrate that the tomb is empty. But we also recognize that even though Easter has come, we, we still have broken places within us. We still come to our Lord's table to find healing and forgiveness, to confess our sins and to cast away our fears, to, to roll away those stones that, in our, that are in our way to be able to grasp the hope and the joy and the triumph, the victory that is Easter. 
But to get to Easter, to get to the resurrection, we have to travel through the pain and the hurts of Holy Week. For without Christ's death, he cannot be risen, alive. And we, we can't say the tomb is empty. And so, even on this day, this resurrection day, this Easter morning, we remember. We remember, you know, just a few days before how Jesus and his disciples had come to Jerusalem. And it was Passover. They were in the upper room. They came to celebrate how God had heard the cries of the children of Israel when they were in bondage and slavery in Egypt, how God heard their cries and had delivered them to the promised land. And Jesus would take the bread. He gave thanks to God. He broke the bread. And then he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. Later, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks to God. And he gave it to his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so, we once again come to our Lord's table. Because not all the stones have been rolled away in our lives. Not all of the brokenness has been healed yet but we continue to come for healing and forgiveness so that we can go out and share the good news. Be beacons of light for love and mercy and justice to show kindness where there is hatefulness. All of this, all of this, because even though Jesus was betrayed, even though he was beaten and tried and, and hung on the cross and put in the, in, the, in the tomb, the story doesn't end there. Jesus came to show us how much God loved us. And when we break the bread and we, we take our cups, we'll participate in his saving actions for all of humankind and for us. So let us, as we prepare to break bread and take the cup, with the boldness of little children, pray together our Lord's Prayer, say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God, what you have gathered in your homes as we're connected are the gifts of God. For the people of God, wherever we are, Take your bread. 
the body of Christ, broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of Christ. Take your cup, the cup of the new covenant, the blood of Christ, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this in remembrance of him. We've broken bread, we've shared the cup, we are ready to go out into the world and, and live as Easter people, forgiven and free, ready to speak for truth and justice, ready to be loving and kind, ready to be merciful. Amen. Amen.